Hello everyone and welcome to this Griffith University alumni webinar. Thank you for joining us from your various locations around the world, countries as far afield as Japan, the UK, Norway and the USA. My name is Joanne Nyland, I'm the Deputy Director of Development and Alumni at Griffith University and I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which those of us in Australia are respectively located. Pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Griffith University has over 200,000 alumni in over 140 countries around the globe and keeping in touch and providing alumni engagement activities to you all can be a bit challenging, especially in the current COVID-19 climate. So being able to deliver today's event online provides the opportunity to connect with so many more of you than might otherwise be possible. We do greatly value our relationships with you and love to stay in touch. And that's why this year we're doing a major reconnect campaign to find those alumni we've lost touch with and also to enrich the information we know about those we are connected to so that we can offer targeted communications and activities. Your assistance in updating your own information and encouraging those who we might have lost touch with but who you might still know to update theirs would be greatly appreciated. I'm sure the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting many of you and we of course wish you all the very best as we all navigate our ways through this. For our current students, this is perhaps the most difficult time they have faced as we've moved our teaching online and for many, part-time work has dried up. So we have launched a COVID bursary programme providing immediate support to those facing the harshest challenges. And I would encourage you to get involved if you can in supporting these students through donating to the COVID-19 Student Support Bursary. You can find information on how to do this on our website and thank you. Before I introduce you to our speakers today, a little webinar housekeeping. A tip sheet on how to participate in today's session was emailed to you. However, just a reminder that you can ask questions about the content at any time in the Q&A panel on the right hand side of your screen. These questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And we know that many of you will be joining us from home and we'd love to see where you are. And perhaps if you have some furry colleagues that might be watching with you. So please share images as well as any key learnings you get from today's session using the hashtag uh, Griffith Alumni on our social platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. Now you might have seen from the marketing that today's event is a joint initiative of the Griffith University Alumni team and the Golden Key International Honor Society. And I'm delighted now to introduce to you Cindy Morris, who's a third year nutrition and dietetics student and treasurer of the Gold Coast chapter of the Golden Key International Honor Society to talk a little bit about their work. Cindy. Thank you, Jo. As a member of this year's Golden Key Committee, I would just like to extend a warm welcome to all the Golden Key members who are joining us today for the webinar. As I'm sure you know, Golden Key is the world's largest collegiate honors society providing recognition for high achieving students and helping its members to realize their potential through academics, leadership and service. So I'd just like to really remind everybody to take advantage of the opportunities that Golden Key offers. At the moment, there are a large range of scholarships on offer. Last year, three members of Golden Key Griffith chapter won scholarships. And as an example, one student received a scholarship to travel to India and they are involved with a rural community hospital project. And that's just one of the many types of scholarship opportunities that are available. If you'd like to find out more, just head over to our Golden Key website. You can also follow us on Facebook for updates on presentations like today. Of course, our live events have been limited this year due to the current situation. However, we are very pleased to be able to bring you presentations like today with a lot of webinars on offer at the moment. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's webinar focusing on adaptation to climate change. And I'd like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Johanna Nalau. Dr. Nalau is an Australian Research Council DECRA Fellow, Griffith Sciences Outstanding Young Alumnus 2019 Award winner, and Adaptation Scientist with a PhD in Climate Change Adaptation. Her research is focused on understanding how, why, and when people make decisions to adapt to climate change, and what role science can and should play in that process. We hope to learn a lot from her today. So once again, welcome Johanna. Hi 
All right. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm Dr. Johanna Nalau, um, a research, Australian Research Council DECRA fellow, and my, most of my research focuses on, on obviously <laughs> climate change adaptation. So how can we make better decisions in a changing climate? I'm also lead author of the IPCC, so of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so working group too, so we are working on the sixth assessment at the moment, where my role is to look at adaptation, especially in the small island context, and, and trying to assess that literature, what is actually working and where. Um, and also as a caveat, so today I'm speaking really as myself, so as an individual scientist, not representing uh, the organisations. So when I was asked to speak about um, climate change, adaptation, so for me, it's very much about a chance to re-examine some of the assumptions and having the opportunity to really think about, obviously we're in a changing climate, so how do we then um, navigate that? And as was said, so if you have any questions or if something's unclear, please do um, put on the Q&A and I'll, hopefully we'll have a lot of time to have a discussion as well afterwards. So this slide uh, or this picture is um, from the Northern Gold Coast and it really, every time I think about adaptations, this is a picture um, that really comes to mind. And adaptations, so if we think about, for instance, rising sea levels and increases in extreme events, extreme storms, increases in heat waves, you know, so there's lots of climate change impacts that are going to impact the way that we build our settlements, impacting the way that we lead our lives. And for instance, in this picture, you can clearly see, you know, it's a very low lying neighborhood. It's built basically on sandbanks. So there are major challenges coming in the future. If we look at sea level rise, um, increased flooding and increased extreme events in, in these coastal areas. And some of the other impacts that we are already seeing, for instance, with climate change, is the increase in, in temperatures and increase in heat waves. So for instance, in January 2019, so that was actually the hottest month uh, recorded in Australia. And they, it was so, they, te the temperatures were so high that they had to actually suspend Australian Open. So this, this is one example of how climate change, how climate impacts are going to impact on the spot functions. And, you know, even our hobbies and how much we can we can be outside. And most of us would be very familiar also with the example of the bushfires that we had in Australia last year and early, early this year. And now there's also discussions about, you know, about community resilience, but also what if in the future, for instance, we have a bush, massive bushfire situation going on and we have at the same time a pandemic. So the scientific community in particular is, is very much attuned to this kind of cascading multiple risks that we might face in the future. And obviously a lot of the infrastructure that we have built globally is, is on the coast. And, and one of the newspaper articles from a few years ago was uh, th themed as the internet is drowning. Um, so a lot of the high speed internet cables are being put on, on coastal areas. So what does that mean for future uh, infrastructure needs or also functionality? Um, and I think most of us have been working from home. Um, so we now understand how important it is to make sure the infrastructure we have in place is actually resilient, um, also going on, going uh, towards the future. Another study that looked at, for instance, cyclone zones uh, is projecting that those might start shifting because of climate change. So what does that mean actually then, for instance, for adaptation? So in regions like Brisbane and, and the Gold Coast, we haven't had a major storm since the 70s. But if that belt would tr start um, coming down south, that would mean that these areas as well might start seeing increased cyclone activity. And that has obviously massive implication, not only community safety, emergency management, but also, you know, key infrastructure and then also housing standards, insurance and a whole, whole lot of other things. And globally, we have already seen that even the discussions and the risk and the increasing coastal erosion is impacting, for instance, um, home values in Miami. And already there are lots of coastal areas, especially in the east coast of the US, where the insurance companies no longer offer insurance. 
So many of these extreme events were also these kind of slow, uh, slow onset processes like sea liver rise have a major impact as well in where we can live. Um, and for instance, if we are consistently seeing areas flooding, at some point there will be tough decisions that we have to make uh, where we live. But a lot of this is really about the things that we value. So climate change will impact on, for instance, coffee. And if you are anything like me, I need to have my morning uh, flat white in the morning. Um, that really starts my day. Um, so, but in globally, this sector is already reporting, you know, increased temperatures uh, in the in those locations where the coffee farms are. That's leading to new types of pests coming in. Um, also, the coffee plants might not be growing as well. In some cases, there might be too much rainfall. In some cases, there might be too little rainfall. And some of the farmers are have started, for instance, moving their farms up the hill on the mountains where their conditions are still a bit cooler. But obviously, that as a strategy is not very long term because once you get to the top of the hill, um, there's not much you can do. And we are seeing so some of the researchers at Griffith University have been looking at, for instance, chickpea farmers in, in Australia and how they are dealing with new pests that are coming in because of increased temperatures and other factors. And wine growing regions and the wine sector is also noticing changes. So in Australia, some of the wine uh, companies have already bought land in Tasmania because the cooler temperatures there uh, seem to, they are pro looking at the climate trends and already also seeing, seeing impacts uh, in those places where the farms are at the moment on the quality of the grapes. And this is a similar thing that's happening in Europe at the moment. So last year I had the chance to visit from Portugal and we visited an organic wine farm where they also said that they had extreme temperatures so over 50 Celsius and what happened to their grapes was that they just boiled um, and they've never had seen anything like this before. So a lot of these kind of examples really hammer down the message that the climate is changing and a lot of the sectors and a lot of the activities that we rely on will probably need to be rethought. But essentially climate change adaptation is about values and the decision making processes that, that we put in place. This is one of my favourite pictures actually from the <clears throat> Global Warming Ready campaign that Diesel did in 2009. And some people look at this picture and go, I mean obviously this is Paris in the future. And some people look at this picture and say, this is amazing. You know, you can have palm trees, you, sunshine, amazing weather. You can have a lizard instead of a dog. And for some people that looks like heaven and they're like, well, yes, I would move to Paris if, <laughs> if you know, if the, if the weather is definitely warmer uh, in the future. Some people who love Paris as it is today would say, well, this is awful. Like I would never want to live uh, if, if in Paris, if that's what it's going to be look like. So a lot of the decisions are based on our values and worldviews and things, you know, things that we value. But when it comes to decision making, we also have to realize that we have to make choices. And so last year I wrote a, a piece for the conversation with one of my colleagues from the RAND Corporation and basically looking at at the argument that we can't save everything from climate change and we will have to make choices. And it was very interesting that this piece in particular raised a lot of comments, a lot of discussions and a lot of debates. So we discussed, for instance, how much money there's available for adaptation, but also the concept of adaptation triage, which means that we only have a set of resources available to invest in adaptation and I'll talk about shortly about different strategies that are being uh, put in place globally. But the thing is, the resources available are finished. And so how do we actually make decisions? 
And there was a case that we cite in this um, in this paper or in this article of a lighthouse in the US. So that was, you know, a really important cultural heritage for the community. But what happened was that there was increased erosion, increased storm activity in the area, and the lighthouse was about to fall into the sea. But the community rallied around and said, this is really important for us. This is part of the, you know, the, the feel of the community, you know, the, the sense of place that they have. And they had the resources and rallied around the resources and were able to move the lighthouse 200 meters inland so that it could remain as part of the place. So this is one example, but there's lots of countries and lots of communities who don't necessarily have such resources available for them. But so I hope this doesn't sound all doom and gloom, because um, when we talk about climate change, it often often seems like this big uh, phenomenon, a big process that has a lot of negative implications. And as of maybe the examples that I've already mentioned about some of the some of the real impacts, how they are already affecting sectors and communities. But there are a range of strategies that are being put in place so that we can deal with these impacts. So for instance, there has been quite a lot of research and also investment in coastal infrastructure measures like building seawalls. So with sea walls, for instance, on the Pacific Islands, these are put in place to decrease the rates of erosion and in some countries to help really to deal with also the long term implications of sea level rise and securing safer and resilient communities. But obviously with these sea walls, there has also been cases reported where you put in a seawall and it actually transfers the wave energy to other areas. So that brings in really major issues of justice as well. And again, also how we make decisions as a, you know, as a big community where we have to look after each other as well. Ecosystem based adaptation is another uh, set of strategies where, for instance, in many developing countries in particular that are low lying, there have been major projects in, in investing in mangroves in those ecosystems where mangroves would occur naturally. And so those planting those mangroves is actually creating a buffer um, that can help reduce sea level rise, but also increase the siltation um, as well. And those projects seem to be quite popular, especially with the uh, Pacific Islands. And also in Australia, we have lots of programs and lots of natural resource management strategies on the coast that focus on strengthening the coastal environment so that we have more buffer, for instance, to protect us from storms. There's also issues around improved emergency management. So as I mentioned, the Australian bushfires, so there's a really an opportunity to rethink the strategic, but also the operational plans. How do we deal with increased bushfires? If these are occurring more often, if they are more intense, what does that look like? Also, what does that look like for staff capacity? So we run, for instance, in 2012, a roundtable with emergency agencies from Australia, from different states, and with people also from, from Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. And all of these participants said they have already seen quite big uh, changes in the operational environment in terms of the, so they see more and more and more events happening, but the time to rest in between those events is getting shorter and shorter. And already then, this is what, eight years ago, they were really concerned of their staff capacity to deal with increases in extreme events and also extreme heat. And what we've seen reporting on the Australian bushfires, a lot of the firefighters have said they have never seen anything like this, what those fires were and how many communities were impacted. So there's a clear opportunity really to then rethink um, and make sure that those plans, both strategic and operational plans have actually can make sure that communities in the future as well are more resilient and adapted as well. And obviously with the with the world as planning regulations as well. So this is what a lot of the state and local governments all across the world are now looking at. How can we incorporate, you know, 
these sea level rise projections into also planning which areas should be developed and which shouldn't. And in cases where we already have quite vulnerable infrastructure and vulnerable coastal communities, how can we make sure uh, that those decisions enable those communities to thrive in the future as well with the climate change impacts? And obviously speaking in a post COVID world, there's massive issues for health. And this is not only new diseases. This is also, for instance, if we have increased temperatures, we have heat waves in places that haven't had heat waves before. So what is the capacity of the health services to actually deal with that? And how do we then communicate that information to communities who might not have experienced, for instance, bushfires before, who might not have um, experienced heat waves before. So it is about increasing community capacity as well to understand the issue, but also to deal, deal with the consequences of heat waves. And there's this and there's also urban heat island effects and lots of issues for urban urban planners to tackle for sure. And there's also insurance. So in some cases, as I said, some areas have are being reclassified where it is much harder and much more expensive to, to have, a, have insurance. And for instance, in the cases of big bushfires, there will be discussions which communities and which houses can be insured. So those kind of big events will have quite a big impact on, on communities as well. And whether if you live in, for instance, in a very flood prone area and there's increases in the frequency of flooding, so some insurance companies are looking at, okay, we can bail you, what, two or three times, but after that, how many times will they be repaying if, if there is an increase in the frequency of the events in particular? But there's quite many strategies that people are thinking about. Um, so on, on top of all of this, and I thought I'll share some examples globally what, um, what we've seen. So one example relates to housing designs. So there's, um, and this is just one <laughs> quite normal, still normal looking house, but there's quite many, many interesting designs out there nowadays on hurricane resistant housing, for instance, in, in America, where they are using resistant boat building techniques and designs to make sure that the houses that are being rebuilt, for instance, in these areas uh, where they have these major storms, so they so people can actually still live there and be safe. So in some cases, it doesn't only mean that if climate change impacts, for instance, sea level rise and flooding increase in storm activity, that that means straight away that we have to retreat and relocate all these communities. But as I said, these are really these are decisions of often of the future. But some of the communities are already starting to discuss what they can do. And this is another example from Bangladesh. So this uh, this design actually won a international risk award. So Bangladesh has lots of coastal of flooding and the projections how many people will be displaced by sea level rise is very alarming. So they had a call for different ideas for design. So how could families build their houses and, and still survive flooding, for instance? So this is an example where you have the family living kind of on a floating house and you also have a farm on, on the on the rooftop of, of that house as well. In the agricultural area, so there's lots of um, strategies there that are being thought about. So you have large scale commercial farms, you have smallholder farmers, you have, you know, who live for subsistence and they're smallholder farmers who are farming products for the market. And so there's different strategies that you can put in place. You can see some of them here. So increased in actually in environmental outcomes um, for long term tenure security. So that's one that they are being able. So people have more ownership and more say. So if they do want to do you know, switch crops or do different kinds of irrigation techniques, they have the right to do so. So this is highly important in particular in, in developing countries. Also increased supply chain security. So supply chains, as we've seen with COVID, a lot of them have been hit very hard. So in trying to think about 
you know, what are the impacts? How can we secure the supply chain? So that's another massive area where there's going to be a lot of work that's being done. And also increased diversification. So some farmers, if the conditions worsen, um, some farmers might decide to diversify their income. So even leave farming if it's getting too difficult to do. And this is an, I have to apologize somebody from, from the Alcoholica City Council, but this is this is an, an older map, but this is an example of what some of the cities are doing. So they are actually, so you can do overlays. Um, so as part of urban planning, so you have different, so I've put in, in a flood risk um, zoning, just, just to see which areas, you know, might be impacted a lot in the future. And so this information that's available for communities is also you can do bushfire risk and other kind of risk overlays. Try to understand a bit better your neighborhood, but also the risks that might there might be, you know, for your assets now and perhaps in the future. And another emerging area where there's a lot of work being done is the climate risk disclosure. And that is especially for, for private sector, but also for, so for businesses, but also for, for governance. So trying to understand what are the risks of climate change to the assets, to the shareholders, and a lot of you know, boards and shareholders are requesting now for this information. And so this example that I've had here is Unisuper, which is one of the super funds where a lot of the academics like myself, uh, we have, have retirement savings. So how are they actually dealing with, with climate change and what are the implications then for the customers as well? Um, so that is an emerging area where there's lots of research, but also a lot of action being taken. So that's pretty much an exa some examples globally what adaptation strategies are being put in place and what people are thinking in terms of how they can respond and thrive in the changing do very much looking into the theories so decision making theories around our uh, decision making in general but also understanding the theories around adaptation so for the 15 years uh, last years we've had and seen an increasing demand and and supply of adaptation research so trying to understand how our communities, how our governments trying to adapt to the climate change impact information and then seeing, well, you know, how do these decision making models work? What is best practice for climate change adaptation and what does what do the successful examples look like that we could learn from? And so a lot of my research is looking at that kind of the theories and frameworks and, and being in the theory space, but then also talking to a whole, whole different groups of stakeholders, trying to understand how much of those decision making models and frameworks and the knowledge that we are producing about adaptation, how much of that could be is useful on the ground. And so my research is very much about moving kind of between these two, going back and forth and trying to really understand, you know, what, what the useful information on adaptation looks like a bit on a broader scale. So some of my research has been, for instance, look, looked at adaptation heuristics and don't uh, freak out. <laughs> Though it's a, it might sound a bit wanky, but it's basically just rules of thumb. So what are the kind of guiding principles that people use at work when they are making decisions on, on, on adaptation? So whether it's trying to develop an adaptation policy uh, and, or a new guideline, how to incorporate climate change impacts and the adaptation responses into, into their operational and strategic plans. And so when I started or came to Australia to Griffith to do my PhD in 2009, so adaptation was quite a new policy issue. And so there was a lot of, you know, a lot of discussion, like who should be responsible for investing and funding adaptation. If we have to have, for instance, new seawalls or, you know, more investment across different sectors. 
And so one of the kind of rules of thumb I was looking at was, was this issue around local, because a lot of the, especially the early climate adaptation research was saying, well, adaptation mitigation, so reducing greenhouse gases is very much a global issue, so, but adaptation is a local issue. And in many cases that got kind of reinterpreted, perhaps in the wrong way in terms of that, oh, if it's a local issue, it's responsibility of local governments. And we now we, when we understand more about, for instance, adaptation governance, we understand also that, the, you know, it's not just about a local government. It, the implementation might be local, uh, but you need all the levels of governments, you need the private sector communities, everybody really, really on board. And some of the research that we did then was looking at, you know, the perceptions of responsibility. Um, and, and this was, you know, 2010. So there was a lot of responsibility shifting. So a lot of the kind of different levels of governments were saying, well, no, it's not actually our responsibility. It should come from, you know, higher up or, you know, it should be funded um, at the lower levels. The work that we've done at Griffiths, for instance, has been looking at ecosystem based adaptation. So, as I said, so that's often often in developing countries and particularly it's about planting mangroves, but it's about strengthening coastal ecosystems. And so this picture is from Savai from Samoa. And they had a project there where they looked at kind of boulder walls or rock walls. Um, they also, if you see where the woman is standing with the red shirt, there's um, sandbags and there's also indigenous vegetation. So in this area and with this tourism business in particular, they were very concerned that there was increased erosion and the reason why people go to go to Samoa, uh, especially to Sabai, is to experience, you know, the ocean and the beach. And and so for a tourism operation to be losing the beach was a major issue. Um, so they've had increased erosion, increased uh, storm events. And so some of these strategies they're putting in place in order to, you know, try to sustain the, the kind of view uh, and, and the operations of, of that business. And some of the work that we've done in Fiji, so we worked with um, with hotel managers and directors and trying to understand how are they getting information on weather and climate. And uh, this sounds obviously looks very theoretical, but basically we're just interested, where do they get their information? How do they use that information? And because there is a lot of information around now about adaptation, but also about the climatic protections and trends and, and a whole lot of information, especially around weather. And what we found, and I'll show you one of one of these. And what we found was there were kind of three different groups. And this this what I'm showing here were the kind of independent information seekers. And what we found that they were actually in minority but they had very high levels of professional responsibility. They were very good at information literacy. So they knew how to use online platforms, how to access online databases and where to go to get that information. And they often had a long term personal experience with weather. So they had been uh, working in sailing or, or somewhere else. So they were very familiar with reading the weather so they could actually access sources directly and some of them even were running their own computer models to show what the weather trends were but then lots of people didn't have that they did not have that experience or hadn't been exposed to it and sometimes it had to do with the information literacy so they didn't even know how to access online platforms or what to do with the data or how to interpret even weather data uh, let alone how to use that in making making decisions but a lot of them were saying that they are looking, for instance, into diversifying their products. So a lot of the island based uh, tourism is very focused on coral reefs, diving, snorkeling. Uh, with the increases in, in sea temperatures, we might see more coral bleaching. So they were thinking, well, are there products and activities that they can put in place that are less weather dependent? And that's probably something that we'll also see in the future. So when we discuss climate change, a lot of the times people say, well, there's so much uncertainty, so we can't do anything. You know, we'll only do something once we have 100% information. And unfortunately, when it comes to climate change, it's kind of long-term trends. We will never have 100% certainty 
what's going to happen in 20, 30, 50 years. We have global projection, I should say, I'm not a climate scientist, so I don't do those kind of models. Um, but there are ways that we can look at dealing with uncertainty. And some of the some of it is there are strategies that we can put in place to reduce it. So thinking how much information do I actually need to make this decision? And how can I make a decision that I have flexibility? So I'm not locking in a major decision. So I don't have to build a five meter seawall today. I can take some other actions and wait and see and try to understand how the climate is changing and what other factors are also, for instance, impacting your work, your operations, your organization, your field. And so with having studied adaptation for the last 15 years, I think to me it's becoming more and more apparent that adaptation is really, it's a new mindset. So understanding, so seeing all these bits and pieces of information, trying to have a clear picture, what construct a clear picture, what does what do these changes mean? And then it's almost like seeing around the corners. Uh, it's, it's horizon scanning, it's trying to understand what the impacts will be um, and what can I do now. So when we talk about adaptation, for me it's always, we look at the short term, we just don't look at like the 50 years out, we look at both. And, and that is a very challenging, but it's, it is something that we need to learn to be better at for sure. For sure. And this is my last slide. Um, having looked at a lot of the leadership and management literature, I'm also more convinced that a lot of the skills that we need to make good adaptation decisions also stem from the basic principles of good leadership and good management. So that relates a lot of like seeing around the corners, also understanding what is impacting our organizations or the sectors where we're working and, you know, piecing together that knowledge and trying to make informed decisions um, that can help us to thrive in a changing climate. So that is a very long monologue, but I'm very thrilled that you're all here. Um, so what we'll do next, and I was going to say, so I'd love to connect with all of you. So I'm obviously on LinkedIn um, and Twitter. You can find me on Twitter and on Instagram under Adaptation Queen. And I also write a weekly blog on kind of the intersections of leadership, uh, adaptation and decision making. But next, what we'll do, we'll do um, Q&A. So I'll have so what I'll do for the q and I'll read the question and, and then I'll answer as well. So this is uh, from Sue. So climate change seems like such a central issue to all of our lives, for the rest of our lives, especially for students. How much should our university courses and programs be ramping up their inclusion, consider, considering climate change impacts and protections? And is there a systematic process in place to to do so, and this is specific to Griffith University. At the university, we have, we are in the process, or, and it has already been announced, so there is a climate change beacon or climate action beacon um, that is going to be kind of the flagship for Griffith University climate change adaptation and, and mitigation research. But we are also looking at, you know, how can we how can we incorporate this kind of information? And it's often falls, so when we say climate change, it often falls into sciences. And so it says, well, it's, you know, it's a scientific issue, so a science degree should be looking at that. But I think, you know, we really need to have a broader view. So we should be looking at this information, for instance, in the business school. So how is this impacting, for instance, the way that we set up operations, the way that we run businesses across different sectors? So it's definitely an issue that is much broader. Um, but with the Griffith Climate Action Beacon, we are hoping that there will be those linkages as well to the curriculums. And that's an ongoing conversation within the university. So thank you. That was very good. Um, so Sri is asking, which professions will play an important role for adapting to the climate change crisis? And as a good scientist, I, of course, will say that everybody should play a role. 
But I think what I was trying to highlight with the presentation is that every single sector is and profession is unlikely, whether it's at the kind of business level or organizational level or your individual level, will be impacted in a changing climate. So the professions, we pretty much need everybody on board on that. There's a question from uh, Renee. Uh, what would be the first step in addressing your local council concerning a shift to a more sustainable community? I think we downplay sometimes the role of local community because we select and vote for, you know, for local government, for state government and federal government. So the local community has an incredibly important role to play in that. How to enable the shift? There's small actions that we can each take. So whether it's writing to your local MP, voicing your concern, because a lot of the members of parliament, for instance, they keep an eye out what is important for the community. And if there is, is enough community community voice in, in saying, we, you know, we need this to change or have you considered this, at least then it's going to be on their radar. And you know, some of the members of parliament are actually very approachable, especially and the councillors of local governments as well. You know, so it can be either phone call, email, go into the office, have a chat. But I think it's important to kind of also, you know, be active. And as consumers, we have a massive say in, you know, which products we buy and how we can enable sustainability. And some of the communities are actually getting together and they are creating for urban gardens, community gardens where people can actually farm their own food um, and learn about sustainability as well. And it's interesting that some of those, those um, projects actually now have come off the ground with the kind of post COVID because people are, are worried about, for instance, food supply chains and they, but it's, I think this has also made people realize about sustainability and how they can also live live in a more sustainable way. So Krishna is asking, role of renewables in adaptation. Will adaptation strategies mean shift away from carbon economy? Um, the, so adaptation and reducing greenhouse gases is what we use to call mitigation should go hand in hand. And I think there's a lot of fear uh, when we talk about the low carbon economy, um, that it just means that somebody, you know, that we can't keep living the way we do and it's probably not sustainable. But there's a massive role for renewable energy, energy in playing in, in adaptation as well. So it will mean it will mean a shift to kind of low, low carbon economy. But as we've seen, a lot of those options that reduce emissions are, you know, they are better health wise and also more cost effective. Being, oh, sorry, this is from Roxy. Um, being climate conscious can often feel very expensive. What are some realistic adaptations I can start with? So I'm not exactly sure what, oh, it, well, if it comes, for instance, buying more sustainable products or organic produce, trying to kind of come up with different ways of saving the planet. I think there are some of the realistic adaptations that you could start with would be, it, and, and this is where it often gets very hard. It's very, you know, often, if you think about household level, it's very individual. Um, so for reducing greenhouse gases, there's a very clear set of strategies, you know, like reduce your car use, um, uh, shop locally and all, all kind of things. But for adaptation, it just means even, you know, trying to create more resilient communities. So having stronger social networks, but also keeping an eye on the information that is out there for, for your neighborhood, for instance, when it comes to, you know, what might these impacts mean, increased flooding. So you might have to come checking your insurance if there's more increased storm events things like that. Um, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm not sure what the expensive part was. Um, so there's from question from Michelle. So how much of a positive impact has the pandemic had 
on the climate? And I think that's a question that everybody's asking at the moment. Um, there's different ways of, of thinking and measuring that though. So one of them is that it has clearly reduced emissions. However, it's too early to say whether those, how much of an impact that reduction has had. Um, as many countries are who are moving into more post pandemic like Australia um, are gearing up their uh, kind of normal uh, daily lives again. But it has definitely had that had a positive impact in the way that people suddenly realize how much their lives might be dependent on, on particular networks, particular services. Um, but also we've seen we've seen amazing things. So we've seen governments suddenly giving basic income and supporting communities, uh, putting in services that they said before they were too expensive and government couldn't do them. So there's lots of positive examples. And for instance, the city of Amsterdam, so they have just announced that instead of just going to business as usual, they are going to redesign the city with using donut economics, which is this more sustainable economic model. And we are seeing those kinds of innovations uh, come through and people are talking a lot about green recovery at the moment. So rather than again going to business as usual, what are the windows of opportunity? Where can we actually make more sustainable choices before we just go back to um, the way things are? Um, and there was there are also questions around recovery. Is there an opportunity and will governments integrate sustainable development into the recovery based on existing frameworks like SDGs and how do governments balance economic recovery and climate? Again, that is that is a ma massive issue that the global community is definitely discussing. And as I said, the kind of concepts around green recovery. So I know that the European Union has made very clear statements and they have, I think, agreement of 17 um, states now that that's, that is what they want to do. So they definitely want to ramp up the opportunities for sustainability and not just go back to the economic models that they had before. And the integration of the SDGs has been on the way. And I think this will hopefully kind of, you know, elevate the issue across, well, not just with governments, but also across the private sector. There's a question from Matt. Are there effective ways to educate people to help make a difference to climate change or an effective way to help all people to adapt to this ongoing change? I think what I have to say that I've been really positively surprised is the innovation and is the community resilience and the amazing way that communities have been pulling together um, during this pandemic in particular. And that has really given me hope again that hopefully uh, when we move, um, you know, towards climate change issues and action again, so that, that we can learn some of those lessons for sure. Uh, and what we've seen in the business sector has been quite amazing. You know, they a lot of them have pivoted. They they think, well, we have the staff, we want to pay the staff, we can't keep keep the business model in place. For instance, there was um, a case um, in Melbourne where a nightclub actually switched to delivering hand sanitizers and all kinds of cleaning products, so they could keep their staff on, but they could help the community members who were kind of you know locked up in their homes. So we are seeing a lot of that kind of. Um, examples of, of innovation. And I think for the more that I've studied this, the more I think it is about the mindset and awareness. So it is about the messaging as well. And I think, you know, part of the role then is also for scientists for, like myself to try to communicate more clearly and to different audiences as well. So it's not just writing scientific papers, but it's trying to actually reach out also to different groups in the community and have a, have a discussion because this is all very complex as well, but there are kind of certain strategies and um, ideas that we can we can benefit from. And there's a question from James. Where can we find research and forecast on the probability of major weather events such as cyclones and rainfall across oh, sorry <laughs> across Australia uh, as a result of climate change? So Australian government has been investing quite heavily um, in this kind of information and I didn't have the slide here, um, but there is 
there's databases and, and for instance the Bureau of Meteorology has a lot of good information and they've been investing heavily trying to understand better what you know what is changing for Australia. If you're interested more on the kind of um, also adaptation side, so there's the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility that we still host at Griffith. Um, so that's NCAF and I can post, post those links also when, when uh, these slides get sent. Um, that looks at also, well, you know, across all these sectors that I've been thinking about, but it's very specific to Australia. So I'd definitely recommend, and CSIRO does amazing, like they've been really leading the climate, climate science for Australia. And so there's also a couple of questions around urban planning. So how can urban planning facilitate climate change adaptation and mitigation actions or how prevalent are climate adaptation plans in government planning? I'd say that they are, so first of all, there's lots of opportunities. So like we talked about, for instance, you know, looking at which, which areas might be highly vulnerable and for what. Um, so, and understanding the way that people are moving at the moment, if we have, for instance, heat waves, um, increase in heat waves, what does that look like? Where are the neighbourhoods that would be particularly vulnerable? Uh, what is the public transport service system look like? How can we get, get you know, people moving? What are the services and facilities that they can access? I think they, so plans and policies and strategies are really important. And the Paris Agreement, which is the global agreement on climate, really look, you know, kind of ask all the countries who have committed to the um, United Nations climate change framework, you know, to produce a national adaptation plan. But I think at all levels of government, so it's not just a federal national adaptation plan, but a lot of the state governments have been already working really hard and try to also think about the kind of, you know, low carbon economy and the actions that they can take to help enable communities to become more sustainable and the same with local governments. So I think there's for urban planning in particular, there's a massive role in trying to understand how we can, you know, what options we need to put in place, but also look at the kind of changing trends and, uh, and how, the, how the city can, uh, can respond to that. And also bearing in mind the role of urban connections as well. So I think that's been very, become very clear as well during the pandemic. And there's a question from KG or KJ. Um, based on that background, my question is, what are the best practices and methods Methodology around quantifying climate risk for stress testing models that will then flow into the strategic and business planning processes? That is a very good question. Um, yeah, I will would probably have to get back to you on that. So there's there's a whole lot, of, especially when they're looking at the kind of climate risk disclosure. Um, so there's a whole heap of models there and also the governments have also they, their own models, how they are quantifying climate risk. Um, but I would actually like to get back to you on that. So I'm hoping the organisers are likely to have, have, hopefully, have your email and if not, can you just pop it in the, um, in the question and answer one. So there's a question from Anna. Um, can you talk more about adaptation triage? how to make decisions from resources to make them are finite. Um, yes, yeah, so this is this is like an emer a very much emerging emerging area. And it's very difficult because as I said in the beginning, you know, when we talk about even communities, it's we don't have just one community. We have people who live in the community but have very different values. You know, they might value very different things. Um, and so when we start talking about adaptation to climate change, there are going to be a lot of conflict and we already see with, with any decision really, especially, you know, within governments or even within businesses, there's also very different perspectives what the resources should be spent on. Um, but in the case that I mentioned, for instance, the lighthouse, that in that case, the whole community decided that that's what the resources, you know, should be spent on. Um, but what we've seen during the pandemic as well, the governments have had to make some really, um, really tough choices on, on triage. So where should the resources be, be invested? And most of the communities at the moment, for instance, in Australia, don't necessarily have to look at those things, um, but they, 
But I know in the Pacific Islands, for instance, there has been already community relocations where they just have made the decision that, you know, rather than kind of trying to stay put in place, um, the resources that they have available will be directed to relocating the whole community. And this is the last question. So, oh, sorry, <laughs> final question from Nanad. Um, wondering, will the actions we take today be enough to make the real impact of climate change or is it maybe too late? Um, so somebody who works on adaptation, I am optimistic. And I think what, and I'm sorry I keep going to the pandemic, but obviously that's on everyone's mind, but especially in Australia, it was amazing to see that, you know, a lot of the things that we said were, were not possible, um, the co you know, the governments and the community really, um, really made this happen, we hit plus and curve. So I do believe that there is, um, you know, there's so much that we can do, um, you know, as a community. But it, it is, it's not only about individual choices, it's choices at every level.